Father, we are all we are because of him. Our life sustains meaning and relevance because of him. Without him, we are not. Can we honor him? This meeting is not about any one of us. It's an opportunity to give him glory and to give him praise. Father, we bless your name. We give you glory. We give you honor. We magnify you, Holy Spirit. Tonight again we ask that you do what only you can do. Your word said times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Father, we have come for that encounter that will shift us to higher levels of glory. We have come for that encounter that will kill every tendency of flesh and shift us to realms of greater intimacy with you. We have come for that encounter that will empower us to handle greater kingdom responsibilities even as we align to your eternal agenda on the face of the earth. We have come with hunger, hunger for more, more of you, more of your grace, more of your love, more of your dimensions, greater than we have seen, Lord. We press for tonight. And so we ask for utterance, we ask for ascension, we ask for movements in the spirit. Empower us, draw us into deeper places, O Lord and let your name alone be glorified thank you father for all you have been to us and all you've done for us father we are grateful and we bless you for everything we say let your name alone be glorified because only you deserve the praise and so thank you everlasting redeemer even for this short moment we are going to have hearts will be transformed decisions will be made impartations will be granted activations will be granted transfigurations will take place and so for that we say let your name be glorified thank you Abba father thank you precious redeemer in Jesus precious name we have declared amen give the Lord a big hand of praise <clears throat> glory to Jesus you may be seated while I was waiting to come I logged in and I spoke I saw God's servant roaring like a lion. So I'm already aware that the fire of God has fallen in this place. And so what I'll do tonight is to teach you a few secrets that is necessary for the next level. I didn't know I was going to minister, but while I was talking to the Lord in the hotel room, the Spirit of the Lord began to witness some truths to my spirit man. And I titled it, Supernatural Existence. And that's what I want to share with you tonight. I'll just show you a few points and then as much as we can take, we will take and then we'll trust God for the move of the spirit and we'll make some declarations over you and release you for next year. But trust me, every one of you hearing me tonight, you will be champions. Yeah. And from next year, dimensions of your life that has not been experienced or witnessed by anyone will find expression. Yeah. In the mighty name of Jesus. Praise God. You may be seated. There are three things that borders the heart of the Father. There are three emphases that defines the weight of his agenda on the earth. You know, God has many realms, realms of influence. You have the third heaven. And the third heaven has many civilizations locked therein. You have the second heaven, and then you, are the, you have the first heaven, where earth is also a part of the visible creation. And so the agenda of God transcends this visible realm. But as far as humanity is concerned, and as far as the visible realm is concerned, there are things that borders the heart of God. And if your existence will count, you must know what those things are and you must align yourself with those realities otherwise your existence will be a waste i'm happy that like myself there are many young people here tonight and so it, you have your life ahead of you and this is the best time to learn this truth i'm about to share with you these are the things that makes your existence count and trust me if these things are not there in your life you are wasting and you are wasting very fast when you come to the end of the year like this it is natural for you to sit down for those who are reasonable to count 
your blessings, to ascertain how well you lived in the last 365 days, and to find out the progresses, the successes, and the achievements that you have recorded. But you see, most times, the things we number are not things that hold weight in the realms of the spirit. Somebody may sit down and he's recounting the successes of this year and he's talking about the cars that he bought, the houses, the lands, and the things he would have procured. As beautiful as all of these things are, they don't have weight in eternity. And so before you count what really matters, you need to go to the heart of the Father to know the things that trouble him, the things that matter to him. And when you are counting your achievements, these things should stand tall amongst the things you will record. I'm not by any means saying your success in time is not a factor. But I'm saying in the scale of things, there are other things that are more significant. And one of the reasons we are here tonight is to fortify us so that going forward, we may become strategically positioned to fulfill those things that are a huge demand in the heart of God. And I've been able to summarize it as much as the Holy Ghost has revealed to me into three broad categories. And I will lift, list those categories tonight because the factors and the forces I'll be outlining for supernatural living will not be relevant except as they come to empower you to push in these things I'm going to be listing now. Praise God. And so the three things that gives eternal essence and relevance to your existence are number one, intimacy with the Father. The depth of your relationship and your walk with God. You know, in the realm of God, the princes are aware that it's a privilege to walk with God. In fact, one of the things that confers authority on you when you get to eternity is your proximity and your intimacy with God. You know, when Zacharias was ministering to the Lord in Luke chapter 1 from verse 17, and the angel Gabriel appeared to him, he brought him an errand, an errand from God, a secret that God was about to activate in his generation because that was a generation waiting for the coming of the Messiah. And so only those who were very significant in God's agenda were allowed disclosure into those matters. And Gabriel happened to be one of the angelic functionaries that God gave access to what he was doing as touching the salvation of humankind and the era of the Messiah. And so when he came to deliver this message to Zacharias, he perceived that Zacharias had understanding on these matters, given that he was one of the high priests. But unfortunately, Zacharias was deluded as touching what God was doing at the time. That was not a, a problem because intimacy is a personal thing. The unfortunate thing is that when Gabriel delivered the message, Zacharias doubted him. And Gabriel looked at him and drew authority from his intimacy with God. He said, I am Gabriel that standeth in the presence of God. I have brought you these glad tidings and you doubt me. He said, because of the authority I have by reason of my intimacy with God, you will be dumb until the day that these things are manifested. That means in the realm of God, intimacy is something beyond relationship. There are powers that are locked into our intercourse with God. And so when a people are going to be relevant with God, one thing that would determine the depth and the scope of their relevance will not necessarily be their position among men. Because you can have a very high position with men, but in the realm of God, you are nothing. You can be very wealthy on earth, but in the realm of God, you are nothing. If you study Luke chapter 16, there was a man that heaven addressed as fool. This man had filled his balm, and he said, now my soul can rest. And they asked him from heaven, do you know the meaning of rest? Who told you money brings rest? Who told you wealth brings rest? He said, tonight your soul shall be demanded of you. Because the man was rich on earth, but towards God he was poor. He didn't have a relationship with God. Because one of the things that matter to God the most is the degree to which and the depth to which we walk with him. In Deuteronomy 32 verse 9, the Bible speaking, he said, the Lord's portion is his people. He said, Jacob is my inheritance. So what God stands to inherit from the project of creation is the relationship that he enjoys with men. And the devil understands this. This is why his greatest attack on your life is on your fellowship with God. There's nothing the devil is doing in your life that is not designed to hinder your relationship with God. 
any attack of the devil, be it on your health, be it on your finances, be it on your relationships, be it on your circumstances, is designed to bring you to a point where you are detached from the realm of God. Adam didn't have that understanding that his greatest wealth in Eden was not apples. His greatest wealth in Eden was not the things he enjoyed. His greatest wealth in Eden was his relationship with the father. And when the devil came, he didn't know that that was the object of the devil's attack. The devil wanted to create a system of rebellion that would break that relationship. The moment that relationship was broken, Adam began to toil. Adam began to walk under the elements of this world. Adam began to struggle for what to eat and what to drink. Adam began to struggle with sin and iniquity. It therefore means that everything we have, the quality of our life, is a byproduct of our intercourse with the Father. This is why the Bible said they know not, neither will they understand. It said they walk on in darkness. I have said unto you, ye are gods, because we are the children of the Most High. He said, but you will fall like one of the princes. How can a prince become a slave? A prince can become a slave when his relationship with God is hampered. When your work with God is affected, although in the spirit you have a statue of a prince, but in manifestation you will operate like a slave. Our poverty, our sickness, our struggle with sin, our weakness are all a product of our lack of relationship with God. Because the way God designed it is that there is a mutual benefit that exists between your relationship and him. As you relate with him, he derives pleasure. And as you relate with him, the quality of your own life also increases. You know, when John was carried to heaven in Revelation chapter 4, he discovered something that was one of the biggest secrets of creation. The 20 and 4 elders were worshipping, and while John drew his attention to listen to their worship, they made a statement that is one of the biggest statements in the Bible. In Revelation chapter 4 verse 11, they said, All things were created for thy pleasure. That means creation is irrelevant except as it gives pleasure to God. And the way to give pleasure to God is to build a robust work of intimacy with God. Listen, ministry is useless if it is not a product of your, of your, of your intercourse with the Father. Everything we are building, you can call it Jesus resident ministry, is a bastard if it does not come from your intercourse with the Father. That business can be called Jehovah the King Supermarket. If it does not come from your intercourse with God, it is a bastard in the realm of God. Because the way creation is designed is that creation is a product of the inspiration of spirits. And if it is not coming from your intercourse with the Father, it means either the world system or another spirit whispered that inspiration to you. And not too long, the signature of that ministry, the signature of that business will reflect the nature of the spirit that gave the inspiration that produced it. This is why God is careful that every man must walk with him. Like it was said concerning Enoch, Enoch walked with God. That is not a testimony that should be for Enoch alone. That should be the testimony for every believer. Because when Jesus was talking in John chapter 4 verse 23, he said, we must worship God in spirit and in truth. He said, for the Father seeketh such. There is something God is looking for. God who is all sufficient in himself has a desire. God who is all sufficient in himself has something he's looking for. And what he's looking for are those who can enter into his heart. Are those who can draw from his heart and walk in deep intercourse with him. So that anything he wants to do, you become the extension of God. If he wants to talk, he talks through you. If he wants to visit a place, he visits it through you. If he wants to demonstrate any dimension, he demonstrates it to you because you are vitally connected with him. But unfortunately, more than 90% of those who profess even the name of the Lord don't have a relationship with him. Paul was speaking, he said, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Spirit, he said, let it dwell with you. Intimacy is one of the heaviest things in the heart of the Father. Listen, it's better to have a walk with God and not produce anything than to produce everything in the world and not have a relationship with God. Because all, everything that does, is not born from the realm of God will be destroyed. Because it will be a platform the devil will use to manifest his dimension. Intimacy is a body in the heart of God. And if your existence will matter, it will matter to the degree of your intimacy with God. The second thing
something that is a body in the heart of God that gives relevance to your existence is so winning. World evangelism and world discipleship. You know, after Jesus walked on the earth for 33 and a half years, did ministry for three and a half years and raised disciples, he was about to go. And they didn't know why he did everything he did until Jesus began to address them. And one thing Jesus commanded them to do was to go into all the world and disciple all nations. Because the reason God came is because man is his project and he will not allow man to waste. Nobody creates anything and allows it to be wasted. Nobody creates anything and allows it to be destroyed. And so when, even when it took God to die for man to be saved, God was willing to pay that price. He said, for God so loved the world, John 3, 16, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So God was willing to forego himself in order to save man. So the price that God paid to redeem man was his own blood. To tell you how important man is in the agenda of God. And when Jesus was leaving this world, he extended that responsibility to everyone who has come into relationship with him. So when you have come into relationship with God, the next thing God expects you to do is to bring others into that same relationship. So John was speaking in 1 John chapter 1 verse 1. He said that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. He said, that is what we have brought to you, so that you may have fellowship with us. And he said, truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. So we are saved in order to save others. Paul was speaking along this line in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. He said, to which God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself not imputing their trespasses against them but he gave unto them everyone that is reconciled he said he gave unto him what the word of reconciliation and so if you are sitting here tonight and you have come to december and december is about to end and you cannot tell how many souls you have brought into the kingdom the question is what then is the relevance of your life in the last three, 365 days as far as God is concerned. You think it's the car you bought? How does that affect God's agenda? You think it's the land you bought? How does that affect God's agenda? You think it's the money you saved from that business? How does it affect God's agenda? All of that affects your own agenda. If who you are, what you do, and what you have does not translate to soul winning, you are not relevant in God's agenda. God is in the business of reconciling men back to him. See, sometimes we come from meetings like this and we are shouting fire, fire. What is the fire for? You think the fire is about coming to church and praying and shouting? No. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, it says, not many days from now, you shall receive the Holy Ghost and power. What was the first errand of power? It said that you may be witnesses unto me from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost part of the earth. So if you are not interested and giving to soul winning. What do you need fire for? What do you need power for? What do you need gifts for? What do you need everything you are trusting God for? Because that's one thing God is out for. A man said something and I will never forget it. He said there's one business he knows God is doing every day, every time. It's the business of soul winning. And that's one thing Jesus commanded every one of us to do. In, in John chapter 20 verse 21, he said, as the Father have sent me, he says, so also send I you. In John chapter 15 verse 8, he said, this is how my father shall be glorified. He said that you bring forth fruit and that your fruit abide. Listen, we have bastardized spiritual things. We think spirituality is about acting in a certain way. We think spirituality is about dressing and coming to sit in church and acting as though we are men of stature, having encounters with angels. And when you ask people to talk, they tell you how many cherubims they have met. They tell you how many times they have gone to heaven. They tell you the kind of stature they have with God. And when you read their lives, you cannot see fruits that abide. What is all of that for? Because you don't know what is in the heart of God. When we know what is in the heart of God, like the apostles of old, we become driven by the desire to see the world reconciled back to God. The moment they received the Holy Spirit, Acts 2, 47, 3,000 was added to the church. Acts 4, verse 4, 5,000 was added to the church. Acts 6, 7, a great company of the priests was added to the church. Acts 13, 44, the whole city went to them. 
What do you think was driving them? They knew the body in the heart of God. That the next person will not go to hell because they are here. And so they didn't just seek power for the sake of having power. They didn't just seek encounters for the sake of having encounters. To them, it was fortification to become more fruitful. It was fortification to become more productive. See the number of us that are here. When Jesus left this world, all the disciples on earth were 500. All the whole Christians in the world were 500. That means the people in this auditorium are two or three times more than the people Jesus left on earth. These guys took their generation. Now, look at us who are here. If they allow us with you, we will not be able to conquer you. So what is the quality of our Christianity? If Jesus left 500 people and they took their generation, we are over 1,500 in this hall. There is overflow one, there is overflow two. If Jesus allows us here, to take over Uyo in the next five years. Is there hope for you? I assure you, we will not be able to do it. You know why? We don't know what is in the heart of God. We are pursuing our own personal agenda. We are pursuing our own personal ambition. And we are forgotten what is heavy in the heart of the Father. I wonder how we will stand with the apostles of old when we get to heaven. That in their generation, without internet, without microphone, without planes, they use donkeys. And they traveled from place to place. They were screaming in the wilderness. And they won souls in their thousands. They sat down, wrote gospels that we are reading in our own generation now. We have vehicles, we have planes, we have internet. Yet we are not imparting people. How can a generation where there was no telephone, there was no internet. Somebody can win a thousand souls. Peter preached in one day, three thousand were saved. You are in a generation of internet. In one year, you have not been able to win 300 souls. How can you stand with Peter when you get to heaven? I didn't have, I didn't have Google. I didn't have Facebook. I didn't have YouTube. But I preached one day with the same Holy Spirit that you have. And 3,000 souls were won. You have Google. You have YouTube. You have Facebook. You have aeroplanes that can travel four hours. What we traveled in six months. And you cannot win half the soul we won in your lifetime. How will you go to heaven and sit with them and say we are servants of God? A generation must wake up. We must know the things that matter. Because we pride ourselves in the things that mean nothing to God. We are too much for you already. All of us in this auditorium. Meanwhile, this is a fragment of the church in Uyo. There are over 100 churches in Uyo. With larger than this size that we have here. Why has the city not shut down? He said, Philip went to Samaria. One man, he preached Christ there. And the whole city was filled with joy. Philip went to Samaria. He preached Christ there. The whole city. Today we have 12 branches of churches in one city. Yet that city is in darkness. This is why we are asking for encounters. This is why we are asking for more. Because this is what is in the heart of God. This is what God made the highest sacrifice for. God didn't kill himself for anybody, for anything other than man. God didn't die for anything other than man. When the world was destroyed, he simply recreated it. But when man fell, God dethroned himself. God became a man. God died in order to save man. And the question is, who shall declare his generation? A generation must rise and say, Lord, where you stop will be take over. Where the apostles stop, we will take over. Where the previous generation stop, we will take over. You don't need to have a PhD in theology. You don't need to have a master's degree in, in pneumatology. All you need to do is go and preach to the next person about the love of God, about the faithfulness of God, about the price that Jesus paid. How can you have more than a thousand discussions with more than a thousand people and Jesus is not featured? Can you count how many conversations you've had this year? All of us seated here, even those of us who are in Trovasia, we've had more than 1,000 conversations this year with more than 1,000 different people. How many of them are in the kingdom because we spoke to them? What then is the value of your talking? What then is the relevance of your relationship? What then is the value of your presence? A generation must wake up and say, Father, if you are willing to die to save man, then I will live saving men. I will not live without saving men. If men are that important to you and you will die for them, that's what is heavy 
in the heart of God. And finally, the third thing that is a burden in the heart of the Father is colonization. Systemic takeover. Territorial takeover. Listen, our consciousness must change. It's high time you begin to think differently. You didn't go to the bank for salary, sir. You went to the bank because the witness is needed there. You are not on Facebook because you want to socialize. You are on Facebook because a witness is needed there. You are not in Uyo today because you are seeking greener pasture. See, only slaves travel looking for what to eat. Sons move about seeking inheritance. When you are in Abuja, when you are in Lagos, you are there to bring the government of God to that place. When you are in a school, you are not there as a teacher. Teaching is the platform. But when you get to a school, come with a mindset. I need to bring the government of God to this place. Before I live here, the fear of God must be institutionalized. Before I live here, righteousness must be institutionalized. This is how we must think. He said, go into all the world and disciple them. Your world is your sphere of influence. If you are in the bank, that is your world. If you are in a secondary school, that is your world. If you are in the university, that is your world. If you are on the internet, that is your world. You were sent there to disciple it. If you are in that world and the will, the government and the ways of God are not institutionalized, then you don't know why God sent you there. Brothers and sisters, we are missionaries. We are pilgrims. We are ambassadors. We are high commissioners on the face of the earth. That is why we are called the ecclesia. We are not here because we want to be part of what the world is doing. We are here because we want to change the ways of the world. We came as government agents. We came with a law. We came. Why do you think we are wearing suit here? Because some missionaries came from the U.S., from, from, from England, and they impregnated us and institutionalized their culture. Even though they have gone for more than 60 years, we are still living like that. That's why you are driving on the left. That's why you are drinking tea in the morning. That's why you are wearing suit and you feel important. Because some ecclesias came here and they insisted that they will uproot your culture and institutionalize their own culture. And there was nothing you could do about it because they came with authority. They came with an understanding that was superior to yours. They came with weapon that is superior to yours. So when our people came out with arrows, they came with guns. And our people had no choice but to surrender. But after our people surrendered, they entered the project of civilization. They began to teach us English language and uprooted our many languages. In this region alone, you have more than 50 languages. Which of them are you speaking? When you go to the market, you speak English. When you come to church, you speak English. When you go about school, you speak English. Because some ecclesias came here. Now, when we were going into the world, God gave us authority. God gave us giftings. God gave us power. The idea behind that authority is not to start churches and build auditorium. The idea behind that authority is to also enter into the world. Where there is fornication, you substitute it with holy living. Where there is fear of the devil, you substitute it with power over demons. Where there is lawlessness, you substitute it with the ways of righteousness. And so when you live there, the people have no choice but to imbibe the culture of heaven as their way of life. This is why we are here. This is why we are scattered so that we can take system. And so when we come to church, we come to church as representatives of different constituency. Some come as agents from the internet others come as agents from the bank others come as agents from the academia others come as agents from different realms with different weapons the guy who is on the internet his tool may be video editing the one who is in the university his tool may be a certificate the one who is in the bank his tool may be marketing the one who is in the government his tool is canvassing support but by all means all of us carry weapons and so as we go there we are colonizing the world we are bringing heaven and a day will come if you don't align with heaven you cannot find a place there if you don't align with heaven you cannot participate there because colonization has taken place do you see our government today if you are not corrupt you can't win you know why because some dark agents came before we came that's why if you like have the best interest have the best qualification have the best strategy have the best manifesto they don't care in the last election they were making mockery of the righteous man they say he's a statistician they presented this record they say you should go and sleep it's not statistic they are looking for you know why 
they know that the system is corrupt and only by corruption will you enter. That's colonization. But God is raising another generation who will change the paradigm so that if you are corrupt, you can't make it. You are coming to contest for presidency. You are coming to contest for governor and they are asking you, what is your lifestyle? And then you are wondering, how does righteous lifestyle impact it? The culture has changed. The system has changed. This is why God is raising you. A fire will come upon you today so that you can take the bank. A fire will come upon you today so that you can take the government. A fire will come upon you today so that you can take the universities. Because coloni colonizers, masters, colonial masters are about to rise. Go into all the world. Go into all the world. You know the problem with us? When somebody is on fire, we think we should ordain him as pastor. When somebody is on fire, we think we should name him a prophet. We need very few in church. We need more out there. We need prophets in Senate chamber. We need apostles in governmental corridors. We need prophets in the stock market. They can look at the stock and they know the one that we sell next week. And they, that's how money transfer will take place through divine wisdom, through divine favor. And when they get the money, they advance God's agenda. That's where you need the prophet. See, we have too many prophets on the altar. That's why we don't know what to do. We are fighting ourselves. We have too many apostles on the altar. That's why we don't know what to do. We are drifting towards sentiment and attacking ourselves. We need more prophets in the market. We need more apostles in the market and in the government. You don't know what is happening. Sometimes you go to the market to negotiate. Somebody is carrying a life tortoise on his chest. Because there is a realm beyond certificate. There is a realm where a demon needs to whisper to you. You can go into the market. You are competing with somebody. He shakes you and paralysis hits you. Because he wants to kill you and take you out of the competition. That's how the market works. This is why new functionaries must go to the market. That when you are talking, they look at you. They know where you are going. And they will ask you one question. It will counter you. When you shake them with paralysis, the power will move and come back. And the person that shook you will fall down. He will say, where are you from? He will say, I'm from Mount Zion. The city of the living God. From the realm of innumerable company of angels. To the place where the spirit of just men made perfect dwell. I came from the household of God. I am a witness to my generation. I am an envoy of my generation. I am an ambassador of my generation. Help that brother. That's what we are talking about. See, because we don't understand how to take over this world, we are always running to join. So the people of the world are on internet after 20 years before the church is realizing it. The people of the world are already billionaires in cryptocurrency before the church is realizing it. I'm not saying apostles and pastors to come and teach crypto. No, there's a place to do it. But I'm saying the church cannot be left behind. We shouldn't be joining what the world is starting. We should initiate it. But we are the prophets that will go to heaven and download civilization. We are those prophets. We are those prophets. We are those prophets. The people of the world dominated movie scene and turned the movie industry to a ground of seduction and adultery and immorality before the church wakes up. And so they create, they take over, they corrupt before we now come in to compete with them. See, we need prophets that can look at tomorrow and say in the next 10 years, they won't use screens anymore. We need prophets that can look at tomorrow and say in the next 10 years, they won't use notes anymore. So that they give the church strategic intelligence on how to get ahead of their generation. This is how you colonize. You're colonized by superior wisdom. You're colonized by authority. You're colonized by power. You're colonized by strategies. Things that makes you indispensable in the market until you become the leader. Did you not read your Bible? The Bible said God spoke to Noah to build an ark. Noah was building an ark. The people were laughing. There's no rain. What are you going to use the ark for? Noah knew 100 years later rain was coming. That means Noah was 100 years ahead of his generation. Those are the kind of prophets we are looking for. 
100 years ahead of his generation. When the rain came and the world were rushing in, the guy preserved God's heritage. That's what we are talking about. We need people who are 15 years ahead of the stock market. We need people who are 15 years ahead of governance. People who are 15 years ahead of the academic structure and syllabus that we are running with. Not people who are trained by it. But it will take superior operations in the spirit. This is why God wants to fortify us tonight for supernatural existence. Sit down. Give me 15 minutes. Let me tie the knots. I came with a word in my spirit. God wants me to speak over you. Because some of you, as you walk out of this place, an angel will accompany you from today until you enter your throne. Some of you, as you walk out of this place, the spirit realm will open to you and it will become your teacher. You will know more than your physical mentors. You will say things that are rooted in the realms of the Shamayim. Low a little. If the, if I ascend, I may not be able to share what I want to share. I want you to read the scriptures. It will help you. There are forces in the spirit that makes you sustain supernatural existence, and I'm going to give you four of them out of the many that God gave me. Number one is the glory. The beauty of man is not suit. It's not eyelashes. It's not powder and foundation. The beauty of man is the glory of God. When God created us, what he decorated us with was he put it on us as a perfume and as an aroma that cannot be resisted. And so when you find glory, you will not only be attracted to him, but you have no choice but to honor him. That honor becomes a law that brings dominion. In Psalm 8 from verse 4, the psalmist was asking a question. He said, what is man that thou art mindful of him? He said, what is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou did visit him? That means there is something that comes upon a man that makes that man undespisable. There's something that comes upon a man that makes that man indispensable. That even the greatest of men will be mindful of him. And they will not only be mindful of him, they will want to fraternize with him. That is the glory of God. The beauty that causes men to desire relationship with you. The beauty that causes men to honor you whether they like it or not. That was what the psalmist was excavating for us. In verse 5, hear what the Bible said. It said, For thou hast made him a little lower than the Elohim. It said, You have crowned him with glory and honor. So the thing that is about man, that makes even God himself mindful of him, is the glory that he puts upon the man. And so if man carries something, that makes God mindful of him. Is it the kings of the earth that will not be mindful of him? Is it the rulers of the earth that will not be mindful of him? If God puts something on a man that causes God to visit him, is it the president of a country that cannot visit him? Is it a ruler on earth that cannot visit him? That economy that provokes indispensability, that economy that provokes the allegiance of the greatest of people is what he showed us in verse 5. He put glory upon the man. So, so long as you walk in the economy of glory, you are the center of attraction in your generation. And so when God designed us to live supernaturally, one of the things God put on us is the glory. We were clothed in the glory. And the devil knew that so long as we walk in glory, 
we will be more relevant than him. So long as we walk in glory, we will be more honorable than him. So the fight of the devil against the man in the Garden of Eden was to remove glory from his life. And when the man disobeyed God, glory was taken away. So Romans chapter 3 verse 23 said, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So the glory that makes the man indispensable, the glory that makes the man attractive to everyone and everyone wants to walk with him was what the devil stole from him. And so when Jesus came, Jesus came to restore us back to glory because he knows we cannot be supernatural entities except as there is glory on our lives. So the whole transaction of salvation amongst other things is to bring you back to glory. And so when Paul was speaking in Romans chapter 8 from verse 29, hear what Paul said. I'm showing you spiritual transactions that makes you a supernatural entity. Romans 8, 29, project it for me. He said, for whom he did for no, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of the Son that he might be the firstborn amongst many brethren. Go to verse 30. I'm showing you, these are divine transactions meant for your supernatural life. He said, moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. I said, who he also called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, he said, them he also glorified. So the glory we lost that made us become useless, irrelevant in our generation, was what Jesus came to restore. In fact, in John 17 verse 22, Jesus was praying. And here's what Jesus said. He said, the glory that you have given to me, he said, I have also given to them. And so for you to walk so supernaturally in this world, you must function in the transaction of the glory. The moment the glory comes upon your life, you become indispensable. You know, Moses went to Sinai to pray and a measure of the glory was rubbed off on him. A measure of it. And when Moses descended, in Exodus 34 verse 29 and 30, the Bible said, Moses wished not that his face shone like the sun. Immediately, the whole children of Israel came to submit themselves to Moses. Because it was not just about the law that he was bringing. It was about what was happening to his countenance. When the glory comes upon your life, you become indispensable. Kings will bow to you. Kings will bow to you. That's why he said, arise, shine. He said, your light is come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. That glory is what will cause the Gentile to come to you and kings. So as you begin to grow in the intensity of the glory, the Bible says, first, Gentiles will come. Secondly, as the glory becomes stronger, it said, even kings will come to the brightness of your rising. Because when a man is clothed with glory, kings are mindful of him. Honor is placed upon him. This is what will make you indispensable in your generation. Listen, relevance does not begin with hard work. Hard work is a part of it, but relevance begins with the nature of glory that you carry. If you don't have glory in your life, you will work harder than everybody and yet be inconsequential. And so the transaction of salvation is to bring glory to you. Four things that make for the economy of glory. Number one is the receipt of Jesus Christ. When you receive Jesus, his glory is given to you. That's what I quoted for you already from John 17, 22. The glory you've given to me, he said, I have given to them. This is why we insist that all men should be saved. Because your access, your gateway to the glory is the receipt of Jesus Christ. He is the glorified one. It is your connection with him that brings you also into glory. That's why the Bible said he made him the captain of our salvation, that he may bring many sons into glory. It's like the relationship between the sun and the moon. The moon does not have light in itself. But so long as the moon partners with the sun, when the sun is out of the scene at night, the moon begins to glow. So when you receive Jesus, the glory begins to rise on your inside. So the first economy of glory is to accept Jesus wholeheartedly as your Lord and Savior. The second economy of glory is to keep looking unto him in faith. He said they looked up to him and their faces were what? Were radiant and they were not ashamed. So if you want to start growing in glory, you receive the glory when you receive Jesus, but to grow in the glory, 
you must master how to look unto the Lord. He said, they looked up to the hills from whence cometh their help. He said, their help cometh from the Lord, the maker of the heavens and the earth. The more you look up to God, the more you stay focused on God, the more the glory in your life grows. Listen, the world wants you to look at many things. It wants you to look at your uncle as though he's your God. He wants you to look at systems where you are walking. And the system is, is, is so designed. The moment is 25th, 26th, 27th. You start waiting for salary as though salary is your God. And so you turn away from God and you turn to a system. That's how the world is designed. The world is designed to make you look away from God. But if you know how the glory works, regardless of what happens, you will look on God. Looking unto God is to trust him in all situations. The more you master how to trust God in every situation, the more the glory of God begins to rise on your inside. So you receive the glory in salvation, but you grow in the glory as you put your trust in the Lord. The second way to grow in the glory is through meditation on the word of God. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says, We all with unveiled faces, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, we are changed from one level of glory to another, even as by the Spirit of the living God. Listen, do you see why the attack of the devil in your life is very intelligent? Go and check your life. Most of the attacks you have had is to stop you from trusting God, from discouragement from men, from discouragement from the things of this world so that you come under pressure and you start looking at things other than God. You think the devil is not smart? He knows that if you keep looking unto God, the glory in your life will be rising. And if the glory rises, it will swallow your frustration. It will swallow your challenges. So he will do everything possible for you to turn your gaze from God and turn to a man and turn to a system and turn to an institution. But if you know how the glory works, you will tell yourself, men, systems and institutions are channels God uses to empower me. God is my only source. The psalmist said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. That was a king. That was a warrior. But he refused to look at himself. He refused to look at his mighty men. He said, the Lord and the Lord only is my shepherd. You want to grow in the glory, you must learn how to focus on God. You want to grow in the glory, you must learn how to eat the word. Meditate on the word until the word becomes life in your spirit. And as the word becomes life in your spirit, the word transfigures you from one level of glory to another. And finally, another thing that brings us into a higher level of the glory are the challenges of life. Listen, challenges are not designed to kill you. They are designed to force glory out of you. It says, our light affliction, 2 Corinthians 3, 17, is only but for a moment. It says, but they work for us an exceeding weight of glory. Why we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are unseen. Hear me, brothers and sisters. If you don't have afflictions and challenges, there are dimensions of glory you will never see. There are some dimensions of glory you'll see by meditating on the world. There are dimensions of glory you'll see by focusing on God. But there are other dimensions of glory that is only as you walk through the fire that you will find them. It's only as you walk through the water that you will find them. I can't tell you how blessed I've been by reason of warfare. See, any warfare that doesn't kill you glorifies you. When the devil throws his arrow at you, tell the devil, throw your best shot. I'm not about to go down for my light affliction, uh, but for a moment, they walk for me an exceeding weight of glory. Every challenge comes to glorify me. Did you not read about Jesus? The devil planned to kill him, but the Bible said, if the princes of this world had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If they had known, everything that the devil works for your destruction translates to your emergence. That's why I say all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called by his spirit. Everything work together for good. Hear me? Don't be discouraged by your battles. Don't be discouraged by your challenges. When you are in the pit, tell yourself, a glory is rising on my inside. I may not see it yet, but I will see it because I will not die here. Christ died so that I will not die. And so I know that this will translate for my good. And as you keep at it, as you keep at it, you will discover something that was dormant in you will emerge. There are dimensions of God in my life that were unlocked in the valley of battles. In the valley of battles. Because in that loneliness, in that quietness, in that pain, in that brokenness, 
all I can imagine is the hand of my helper is the face of him that makes me all I can imagine and so God gets into me because at that point there's no more distraction and a new surgery is conducted and as that surgery is carried out when I show up again you'll see greater influence you'll see greater strategy you'll see greater power you'll see greater dimension because the warfare was designed to kill me but God turned it around for my good that's what happened to Jesus the Bible said the spirit drove him to the wilderness to be tempted of the devil after the temptation he said he returned in the power of the spirit the Bible said for the glory that was set before him he despised the shame every shame every crisis every warfare that comes to you give God praise another glory is about to emerge from your spirit yeah. Ah, ah, ah. Ah, ah, ah. you know some people don't know this economy so the moment they have a battle they give up they become frustrated they begin to lament don't lament give thanks something is about to break out of you that the world cannot imagine something is about to break out and I may go to tell someone every battle you have gone through until now has been designed for your manifestation and so as you cross into 2024, that battle has become your platform for manif manifestation. Elohim Adonai Elohim Adonai ah. Elohim Adonai again as a human being the devil will not try to kill him he has learned his lesson even if Jesus comes helpless the devil will never attempt to kill him again he has learned his lesson that there is a glory that could not manifest except as Jesus was crucified he will not make the mistake that's why you too when the devil is fighting you tell him you are making a mistake Something is about to erupt from my inside. Rivers, 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 rivers.
of the things I'm talking about. Three years ago, my life and my entire ministry, yes, yes. as the Lord has committed to me, yes. we won slightly above 35,000 souls. Last year, battle intensified. We won 80,000 something souls. This year, battle intensified. We won over 520,000 souls. Next year, we will win 2 million souls. So I told the devil, don't stop the battle. Keep fighting. The more you fight, the more focused I become. The more focused I become, the more the glory manifests. Can I shock you? Three years ago, all the miracles we documented was about 600 and something. Two years ago, we documented about 1,400 miracles. This year, we documented over 5,000 miracles. I told the devil, please don't stop fighting. Thank you all the agents that the devil is using to fight me. Keep fighting. You are helping me to pray more. You are helping me to focus more. You are helping me to meditate more. And the more you fight, the more I become stronger. The more you fight, the more I become wiser. The more you fight, the more I become greater. You know why? The devil say, gather together. He said, it shall come to know. Speak the word. It shall not stand. For our God is in our midst. He said, he frustrated the tokens of liars. He made diviners mad so that their hands cannot fulfill their enterprise. He said, although the enemy comes in, he said, like a flood, the spirit of the Lord lift up a standard against them. See, there are dimensions of God you can't see until the devil comes. So devil, throw your best shot. Devil, do your worst. We are moving from one level of glory to another. From one level of power to another. From one level of greatness to another. From one dimension to another. Somebody show! Alia. ago sometimes in six months I will see one person drop a stick in one year I'll see two people drop one stick after all the prayer after all the consecration there was a glory that had not been revealed now we go to meetings you talk casually five crutches ten crutches they are heaping them on the ground what happened the level of glory has changed. If I was meditating only, I would not have reached here. But when the devil was fighting, he was adding gear to my speed. Don't be discouraged. The size of your battle is the revelation of your glory. I cannot tell you how many tumors from pie to, H to, to, to cancer to breast lumps that have vanished. I just here disappear and people rush out. I had two more on my left breast. I had two more on my right breast. I can't see it anymore. I can't see it. I had pile for 13 years. I can't see. It. I say, what happened? He said the glory has increased. So when the devil is fighting, God said, keep quiet. Don't fight back. Use that fuel to go higher. Because all things work for good to them that love God, to them that are called. By his spirit. I don't have time to go further. I would have shared with you about authority. I would have shared with you about gifts of the spirit. I would have shared with you about covenant lifestyle. But I don't have the time. I would have shared with you about faith. I would have shared with you about virtue and character as infrastructures for supernatural living. But even if it is this one you learn, it is enough to shift you and your generation will celebrate you. Lift your hands toward heaven. Ask God for an encounter. A glory encounter.
fighting men. Men are not your enemies. Men are used by devils. The devil is your enemy. And you know the way God responds to devils when they fight you? He responds through manifestations of glory and when the devil fought Jesus, God didn't respond with words. He responded with glory. He said he was brought back to life by the glory of the Father. He defied death in order to respond to Satan. Some of you are hearing me now. Warfare is about to cripple you. From poverty to human wickedness to sicknesses to demonic oppression. One minute, pray to God and ask him, for the encounter that glorifies men. The encounter. One minute before I make just three declarations. The encounter that, def that, that glorifies men. Pray in the spirit. Pray passionately. some of you now is that the weight of glory on your life is increasing in the spirit you are literally glowing with rays of light and the devil knows those who carry it because they can see it now the Lord told me that he was going to equip men with light and wisdom to outsmart the world system and to outsmart darkness as they rise to glory, to power, to influence, and to dominion. And so my first declaration tonight is an activation of the spirit of glory in your life. Lift your hands toward heaven. Ushers, the place is choked, so I'm trying to, I'm trying not to be too volatile. The hand of God will come upon some of them, bring them for me, I want to lay hands on them. Something will hit them as they leave this place. Anything they touch will prosper. Anywhere they go, they will become the center of attraction. Because the God in them will begin to manifest. Wherever you are standing now, the dimensions of glory are about to be activated. In this hall, in the overflows, and online. Father, you told me that you are going to awaken glory. You are going to impart light. You are going to stir up dimensions of wisdom. 
wherever they are standing everyone in whom there is an awakening of glory tonight in the name of Jesus I decree and declare let that word rest upon them now carry that grace Ministry for leadership for strategic invasions, territorial takeover, systemic dominion, Masheke, Baragata, Sabak, Tajina, Daliga, Bateria, Baraguna, Santa, Hector Brother, help him, help him, help him. 